What's up, guys? Welcome into a brand new episode of Chargers Weekly. Chris Avery with you. As always, Matt Money Smith joins me. And, and listen, even on vacation, I think this shows his dedication to Chargers fans. Yes. It is 5.30 in the morning, Hawaiian time. Money's about to hit the waves. But first, we wanted to talk to you guys. Appreciate you coming in early, brother. Absolutely, Brad. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's 5.30. I got up at about 3.30 because that's 6.30, of course, Pacific. We're three hours back here, but uh, sun comes up. Sun's coming up right about now. You can kind of see it behind me. Maybe we'll get a nice sunrise for the folks that are watching. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be out in the wave hopefully uh, in the next hour or so and, and probably be out there all day. So stoked to do this, though. I missed last week. Obviously, we had the NFL Network Summit, so I was busy doing that all day, but uh, obviously watched the episode with everyone it was fantastic and uh you know what i wasn't missed so hopefully i'll make up for it here chris you're always missed the birds chirping too man like i i feel like we should just I, not talk let the birds chirp and let people get like a hawaiian like morning pod you know get some aloha <laughs> absolutely hey uh so we missed you last week first the the nfl uh media summit i i saw the photo that you know you liken to like the the head coach photo it, it was you and, and, yeah. and kyle in the corner uh i, oh, I appreciated yeah. that that segment of the photo i think the most yeah there was that uh, we had two so that was the class photo and i don't know if you saw the one before that but they had uh they had jenny garth and tori spelling uh as guests to talk about <laughs> podcasts and like using your celebrity to to, to to run a podcast kind of thing and build a podcast so the photo for that one, when they were included, freaking Sean O'Hara puts bunny ears behind my head. I'm like, Sean, who the? It's like, Come freaking, on, Sean. you know, freaking class bully, man. Guy's a giant, <laughs> six four, you know, rocked up, and he's got to take the smallest guy on the stage and throw bunny ears behind, and freaking humiliating. It's fun though, you know. Jenny Garth and Tori Sp- I had to do a double take, man. It brings me back to like growing up in middle school. I know. Watching 90210. <laughs> It was really weird when they were like, hey, we brought some celebrities to uh, to help kind of, you know, work you through the idea of being a celebrity and using your celebrity to start a podcast. So here's Jenny Garth and Tori Spain who do 9021 OMG. I was like, OK, this should be interesting. It was uh, but it was cool. They were cool. So last week we talked about minicamp and, and everyone who spoke and kind of takeaways. I'm sure you got to uh, brush up on all that was said anything stand out to you from last week uh you know regards to joey and khalil and justin coach talking yeah i think i i think the biggest thing and we've been talking about it through all these podcasts chris but just the speed of justin and and you know that seemed to be a recurring theme of how fast the process is now like they ran that that clip of him, you know, he talked about the the clip of him in the huddle the first time he called that play, and then this year calling the same play and just how different it is. Uh, and here's someone who doesn't have to totally dive into a playbook in the offseason just to understand verbiage and positioning and trying to get comfortable in the huddle for him to be able just to execute plays. I think it's going to it's gonna go such a long way, you know, for someone who's that bright, you know, that committed, that was the other thing that came out, you know, him saying, this is my vacation. I don't need vacation. My vacation is football. And I, I you know, yeah, some guys, the best. Uh, it's like, yeah, okay. But for Justin, that's true, man. We know it, you know, we're around him. So that, I thought those were two good takeaways. Look, I, I'll tell you, I, I think one of the, the things that, and it's way too early to do this, but um, I know ESPN did with Lindsay and I, I'm not trying to, you know, kind of critique her because she was asked to do it. But trying to figure out the 53 is not going to be easy, man. It is not going to be easy, not with all the draft picks and trying to figure out where they fit in. Um, and obviously with all the business they did in free agency. So I don't know, you know, how deep you want to get into that, but what she put together. But I mean, there were there were two glaring names that she left off. And it's like, all right, well, if you want to put Nick Neiman and Christian Covington on, now people got to get booted out. So uh, and we know Nick Neiman and Christian Covington are going to be on the team. Yeah. So it's just, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of talent out there. And, and, you know, you mentioned Joey and Khalil, they all spoke to it. Yeah, they did. And, you know, we talked about this last week, just the competition in really all facets of the team that just wasn't there last year. Like th- there weren't guys looking 
behind themselves and saying, okay, I got competition here. And now they do. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the secondary specifically. I saw a picture That's that Ty point. took of the secondary. It looked like the entire defense, man. That's how many DBs are on this team right now. And, and I just wonder how they're going to figure that out. Like, like who's going to – because because there may be a surprise, a cut or two in that secondary. Where we're like, wow, that guy has been around for a while. So I don't know where it's going to come from, but that – position group specifically you speak to competition like I, I think Ronaldo Hill talked about the fact that the guys weren't looking um behind their back last year this year they are yeah and I think I think a big part of that too is going to be special teams we've talked about this but to me you know you've got your four corners that you feel are set I, I I'm guessing Mikey Davis is going to be back I cannot imagine him not being yeah. back so you got those four yeah, Callahan, you know, uh, Asante Jr., obviously J.C. Jackson and Mikey Davis. And then I think behind that, total free-for-all, and a lot of that's going to be special teams and versatility. You know, can you play inside and out? You know, we, we that is one thing that I certainly took away from minicamp is that was kind of the word uh, of, of camp, versatility. Oh, yeah, this Kyle Van Noy, you know, versatility, Super Bowl champ. Yeah, you can play the edge, but you kick him inside. You know, it, 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 and then you just kind of get the sense that that's the type of roster that that Coach and, and Tom Telesco and company are building uh, is one that can be moved all over the field. Because, look, we know that's what Brandon Staley's all about and his defense is all about. You know, he runs a defense like an offense where there's a pre-snap look and then he does not – it's not going to be what the quarterback saw and you better be a damn good processor to be able to get the best of this defense. So I think that's something to consider too, is can this, you know, if it's Devon Campbell, if it's Jasir Taylor, if it's Dean Leonard, like are these guys versatile? Can they play in and out? So when they're out, can they play some safety? You know, I think a lot of that's going to come into play when it comes to those final four. It's like Lindsay had Tavon Campbell uh, and I think she had Tavon Campbell and uh, Jasir Taylor in the secondary. And it's like, you know, she's kind of guessing, but yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, that's what's going to be fun about it. And, you know, I, and I feel bad because it's, you know, it's guys livelihoods and, and whether or not they're going to be able to play in the NFL. And I don't, you know, I don't mean to put it that way, but it's going to be fun to watch that competition and see one of these or two of these guys grab those spots. You know, in that same vein, I was thinking earlier this week, there's so much star power on this team money. I was thinking of maybe some under the radar guys who are going to be critical to the success of this team. And I put together five names and you can add, take off. Um, but I, I want to go through like these five names and just get your reaction. And guys, if you're watching this, put it in the comments, you may, maybe guys that you think are under the radar that, that really need to have a good camp and could be critical to the success of the team. And the first one, I don't know if you listened last week, buddy, but you know, I saw Trey Pipkins, man. And he just looks like a different yeah. dude. Uh, he's working out with Duke Mannyweather and O'Day and Rashawn in, in Dallas. And he said he was going back after mini camp. And I just feel like it's going to be his right tackle position to lose. And, and if he can play, if he could just play middle of the road, I think you said that a couple weeks ago, middle of the road, right tackle. Um, I think he could play better, to be honest with you. You know, I think we forget that he was a small school kid a few years ago, um, growing into his body. And, and I just, I look at him and that's like the number one name for me, like to look at a training camp, to see how he performs at that right tackle position. Because if he plays well, man, that offensive line is going to be humming. Yeah. I, to me, that's the number one, you know, and it could be storm or it could be Trey, you know, does storm take a step? Does Trey take a step? And, and yeah, I heard last week and, and I think that's what we're all kind of expecting just because of the lack of movement in the market for one of those stopgap players, you know, at, at right tackle, those guys that are, you know, we, we've said the word here before, the old Bill Parcells development for, you know, inhibitors, these guys that you can just plug in and say, okay, can I get just below the league average here for a year and put this Band-Aid here and you're not developing Trey and you're not developing Hymas and you're not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the list goes on, you know, uh, Jamar uh, Salyer, you know, it's like, that's, like, that's another name that's going to be interesting. I think if, to me, if Saul, you're just kind of based on all the reaction after he was drafted, and I know a lot of his me a lot of it is media driven, but I think what people forget, you know, when it comes to a, a player like Saul, you're getting drafted and all of these football writers saying, oh, 
sleeper of the draft. Can't believe this guy lasted till the six. Look, they're not all scouts. A lot of them are reacting to what people have told them. So know that like, if he doesn't make the 53, he's going to probably get scooped up. So like, that's an interesting one to kind of bring into the mix, you know, is these guys that don't like, I thought about Easton stick a couple of years ago. Remember when we were like, are they really going to carry three quarterbacks? You got Philip who never misses a game. You know, and he's got his backup. So what are we doing here? You know, you got Tyrod and who signed this big deal with it. You know, what are we doing here? Um, and they kept him because they knew someone was going to grab him. So that's, you know, I know I'm kind of drifting here a little bit from Trey, but to your point, I, to me, that is the number one guy. It's number one, because if you don't have to put help over there, if you can protect with five and you don't have to worry about just, you know, the right side collapsing in a half second, then, dude, the offense opens up considerably. You know, you have so many things. To, if you can run the back out of the backfield, and now Austin Eckler's in the pattern, you know, and he's wide and he's got a linebacker on him, you know, or he's inside, uh, you know, and he's just running those quick slot routes that Joe Lombardi loves so much. And you think about yards after catch, dude, that changes everything. So, yeah. like, to me, that's the number one guy. Because um, I feel like we saw enough of Storm to know, hey, this is a good backup. It's a guy that's, that's valuable to a team. He can step in if someone gets hurt, you know, and you feel all right about him. Uh, but if you can get, you know, and I think you talked about, Trey, you know, small school, Sioux Falls State. Sometimes it's coaching, you know, and, and, and I, I know we brought this up a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't mean to take a shot at Pat Myers. That's not what I'm doing. But sometimes it just clicks for guys differently with different coaches. Yes. And perhaps this coaching group and now with Coach Nugent showing up or the guy that, you know, the guys that he's working with in Dallas, it just clicked. And it's starting to work for him. So, yeah, I'm with you. Looked like a different guy. And, and man, that would be incredible if it's Trey and, and he's league average. Mike Tomlin, I, so he was on that, that uh, Ryan Clark, Channing Crowder, Fred Taylor podcast. Talk about coaching. Exactly what you just said. Yeah. Basically, basically, like, if everybody could learn, we need less coaches, right? So, it, you yeah. know, it, it, is, it is about coaching. And some guys take to coaching differently. And, um, you know, to, to your point about Storm, Listen, he gained the trust of that staff because he he was he started um, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, he he was there and, and he yeah. toughed it out every single game. So, but Trey was number one on my list, and number two money is, is Kenneth Murray, just because I think that this is such a critical year for him. And if we can get the back half of his rookie year in 2022, and, and he's healthy, and, and that's what I I wonder about is is how healthy he's going to be coming into training camp. And how quickly can he kind of reestablish himself, kind of the, uh, the the shades of that that back half of the rookie year going into his third season with the team? I think the important thing to remember is this coaching staff didn't draft him. And the last coaching staff was incredibly high on him. Like yeah. Anthony Lynn, I remember talking to Coach Lynn saying, this is my favorite, one of my favorite guys I've ever interviewed. That's a leader. That's a franchise changer. That's a tone setter. That's what the conversation was all about. It wasn't. This is a this is the modern linebacker. This is a modern NFL linebacker. This is someone who, you know, he was drafted a because of how he can play, but b really, I think, because of the interview and that and that the off the field. This is going to be the leader of our defense and the leader of our team. Um, so that's that's not this coaching staff. You know, this this coaching staff. I think you saw last year the way they moved him around and tried to find a spot for him. Um, how does he fit into this defense? I, I think it's, I think it's a red flag for Kenneth for sure. Especially when you got guys now that, you know, we were talking about who's the third edge. Well, now you got Kyle Van Noy, all the reports out of camp where Chris Rump looks like he's taken that next step. And we certainly believe in him and the, the flashes that he's shown. So I, I don't look to me. I know that it seems like when we talk about Kenneth, maybe, you know, my tone goes a little negative. That's not what it's meant to be. It's that's a competition spot. And people might not recognize that because you traded a pick, you know, you traded a third and a second to go get that first to draft him. So you think he's fine, but this is a team that expects to compete for a Super Bowl. And if they're better off with Neiman and Amon and Drew, you know, at that position and Troy Reader, who's now in the mix, who was signed as a free agent, like it's a big, big camp for, for Kenneth. And you feel bad because he's coming off surgery going into it. So he's already starting from a disadvantaged position. It's not a knock on Kenneth because it's just the simple fact that he, uh, yeah. he was drafted by another 
uh, administration, right? And and if if he can do what Coach Staley and Ronaldo Hill want him to do, and he can do it quickly in training camp, you know, maybe he can kind of uh, recapture, I guess, some some of that late season success he had his rookie year and really contribute to this team. So I put Kenneth on there just because I know this is such a big year for him. Um, if, yeah. if he's going to make his imprint on this Chargers defense. Number three, Buddy, I, I put a rookie on here because how many times last year did we talk about the second running back position and how they weren't getting anything? Ah. If Isaiah Spiller right off the rip in training camp and these joint practices and preseason – if he can show that he is that dude and Austin Eckler, who's been screaming for somebody to take his spot um, and, and to give him, give him a breath every once in a while, if Spiller can do that, it, it, I think it changes the offense. Um, we, we mentioned last week how you never want to take the ball out of Justin Herbert's hands, but late in games, chewing clock, um, giving Austin a breath. If Isaiah can do that, the the offense I think just becomes more complete. Yeah, I think it's it, it kind of goes hand in hand with Trey Pipkins, right? Yeah. So you got you got to be able to to keep the defense guessing. You know, when when you think about that fourth and one on the eighteen, everybody knew he was running left. You know that Eckler was running left, and the Raiders just guessed. They overloaded. They filled their gaps, and and they made the tackle, and it was a, a tough turnover that led to three points for the Raiders in that game. You know, so to me, that's like it's a two part thing. One you got to find the second back that can spell Eckler and you don't feel like you have too big of a drop-off. Now there's going to be a drop-off. He's freaking Austin Eckler. He's one of the five best backs in the league. Yeah. 20 um, touchdowns. But, yeah. But two, you, I need short yardage. Like I need to find, because it seems like they're not, you know, they use Austin obviously, but it seems like they don't want to put that punishment on him. He does enough, and it's like, you know what? We do not want him banging the A and the B gap when those things are getting hammered by linebackers and safety. So, like, I would love to – and we saw we just struggled. The team just struggled with Roundtree and Josh Kelly, especially in those sets. Um, and I think a lot of that scheme, too, you know, how much of it is you want to pack it in, how much of it is you want to spread it out um, to gain those one or two yards. So, like, that – and so I think that's connected to Trey and the right side of that line, you know, in Zion and can, is it a complete line now when you feel comfortable running either way? Um, and you're not at a disadvantage if you run to the right. Uh, it's funny. The, the second thing, when you said, or I'm going to put a rookie in here, I thought you were going to say JT Woods. He's, um, he's on the list. Just he's on the list. <laughs> okay. So great. So we'll, we'll hit him. So, cause like to me, as soon as you said rookie, I was like, totally agree. Uh, yeah. Woods is so important. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I think, and I love, you mentioned, you quoted, you know, Austin and what he said in the press, or it was great. He's like, I don't want someone coming in to give me a breath. I want someone coming in to run the ball, to take my job, to do some damage. Like I'm not coming off the field just because I need energy. I'm coming off the field because I know the guy that's going in is going to pick up where I left off. I love the way he put that. Yeah, it was, it was great. And you don't hear that from a, from like a bell cow type running back. They usually right. want the ball at all times, but, but Austin knows his body. He knows that, uh, there, there may be limitations with how many carries he wants throughout the course of his NFL career too. You know, he, he, he wants to stay fresh yeah. and, and score Get touchdowns. That contract. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, let, you know what? I had him at five and let's just put him here. Cause I, I think that he's so critical to, obviously we want him to play well and stay on the field because it unlocks Darwin James. That's JT Woods. And, and if, if you could put him back there money and feel comfortable with him and Nas, um, that unlocks Derwin. And, and I, I almost think that that's more important than JT Woods's play is the ability to unlock Derwin. Yeah, because of everything Derwin can do, you know, and we talked about that a minute ago with Staley and what he wants to do with this defense and how what you see pre-snap is not what you're going to see the second that ball is in the quarterback's hands. And the fact that Derwin can rush the passer can drop into coverage, cover linebackers, cover wide receivers. He can work as an outside corner, as a boundary corner, as a press man cover, as a safety deep, as a safety on the line of scrimmage, you know, with his run fills. Like, he does everything. So if you're – but, you know, the, the, the shell, the foundation of this defense is that too high shell. So if you now have that second guy back there with Nas, where Durham would be at times, and you trust him, like you said, I mean, you, you think about – look – not everyone can be 
you know, a quarterback that processes and sees everything. It's one of the hardest things for a quarterback to do. It's, it's what really separates, you know, the talented, the physically gifted from the elite quarterbacks who can see things, who can manage a pocket when bullets are flying, you know, who can find that open receiver the second he shifts his head through his progressions, you know, so very few can do that. So when you've got Derwin now buzzing all over the place and you see him on the line of scrimmage and maybe you think he's coming, so you run up, you know, run some motion to get a chip from a tight end or something. The next thing you know, he's in the middle of the field picking off a quick slant. Like that's that's the next level of this defense. To me, he's and you whatever you want to call him, Queen on the chessboard, Swiss Army Knife, like he's that guy. And he's, you know, when he's healthy, he's probably the best at it. There's nobody better. So to be able to open that up comes on because you have to have implicit trust in those two guys back there that no one's going to get behind him. If for whatever reason, the offense, look, they got NFL players too, right? The old saying, oh, those guys are playing, those guys are making money too over there. If the blocks hold up and the play's allowed to develop in this, in this division, you know, with, with Devonte Adams and Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro and Cortland Sutton, and, you know, and the list goes on and on, like you got to trust those two guys. So if Woods can come out of training camp, with the coaching staff's trust, yes, that also changes the way they can play defense. Also, Nas, if, if Nas can take another leap too in this program, and I, yeah. I, it's so encouraging to hear his name throughout these offseason workouts. Last year and this year, I remember Ronaldo Hill last year saying, you know, Nas is in the room, he's engaged, he's, you know, he, he's the smartest guy in, in terms of like picking things out, questions that are being asked. And Coach Daly mentioned that he, uh, he he caught the eye of of him and the staff along with Jalen Guyton. It's kind of two under the radar guys. So I think Nas and JT probably equally as important. And this list, guys, I mean, like, I, I'm I'm assuming Zion Johnson is everything. You know, yeah. we, we talked to Rick Saratella yeah, but- and saying like this is the plug and play guy. Everything that you know we hear. So like you know Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, wow. Justin Herbert, of course. Uh, the fifth guy I have on this list, money. And I, I want to get your reaction and see any, anybody else you would add to this. The fifth guy I have is DeAndre Carter. And it's a, because of the special teams in impacting the game there as, as a kick returner, but potentially as the fifth wide receiver too. So you don't have to carry an extra wide receiver. Um, he had three touchdowns uh, last year um, on offense. I think he caught like 24 balls and yeah, he, 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 Tom Telesco talked about the fact that he, he played wide receiver in Washington. So, you know, you didn't really get that from Andre Roberts. You got some jet sweeps and, and things like that every once right. in a while. But if DeAndre Carter can replicate what he did on special teams last year, then add a little bit of juice in the passing game, you know, it's a numbers game. We talk about, you know, figuring out that 53 man roster. If he's your fifth wide receiver, maybe that opens up another spot. Yeah, 100% uh, would agree with that, especially just in the return game. You know, to get that, we saw what Andre Roberts did when he got a couple of those big returns and popped him. It just, it, it juices the team unlike anything else, especially if it's the opening kickoff, right? You can return that. Or if the defense has gone out there, you win the coin toss, you defer, you force a three and out, you know, so the team's backed up inside their own 20 or, or whatever it is, 25. And now you've got a, a punt returner that pops for 10, 15 yards and your team is starting at their own 35, 40. Like that just... It's so important, uh, and we saw it last year, how different it felt. And also, I think just speaking to those jet sweeps, clearly Joe Lombardi likes to use them. So to have a guy that has that kind of speed, to be able to be that player, and like you said, to fill that role, because Roberts could not do that as a wide receiver, as a, as a full route, you know, running wide receiver. DeAndre Carter has some value there. So, yeah, that helps with a, a spot. And then, you know, just to add to that, I think you can take that, the specialists. You know, I would put the specialists in there, including Dustin Hopkins. You know, so I, I think J.K. Scott, Dustin Hopkins, DeAndre Carter. It's such an important facet of a championship level team. Um, I think you look at, you know, there's there's a reason you look at the Rams. Right. And, and look how important field goals and punts were. Now, granted, got a little sideways on Matt Gay there in, in the playoffs for a minute. But when he had to make the game winning kick, he made the game winning kick. I mean, my gosh, look at the Bengals for goodness sakes. I mean, you want to talk about how important special teams are. So, Here's you know, I, I think that's exactly. So I think that's, to me, it's those three guys, you know, is Hopkins, they sign him to the extension. Is he, you know, he missed the 150 yard or whatever against the Raiders badly. It's like, you know, do you have a kicker you trust and you trust 
from 55 in when you got to have it. I think that's something we got to see from Dustin is sort of that extra seven yards. You know, let's get outside of 48 and let's get to 55 because that's where guys are making them from now. So, you know, there's that, especially at SoFi with the conditions and how perfect they are. You know, if you're in these AFC West division game battles and you got to have a 55, 57 to, to win it, I know I'm saying it like it's a chip shot field goal, but look, that's what guys are doing now. So, like, to me, he falls in that category. Obviously, J.K. Scott, with the issues we've had with punt, you know, with, with punt return, and, or I'm sorry, with punt coverage, like, that's a big one, too. And talking to some people from the Chargers, you know, these last couple events I've been out at, they're really excited about him. Um, yeah. You know, that, that this is someone they, they were like, well, okay, we got a guy. So, you know, that's – those three guys, to me, can all be – can all be lumped together in, in sort of one, hey, can we get the specialist to be what their name is, special? If we miss anybody, guys, put it in the comments on, on YouTube. Money, is there anything you want to add? The sun is coming up. It's time for you to get I in know. the water, brother. I, 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 I mean, can hear the is, waves. Is there anything else you want to talk about or you just want to get in the water right now? Uh, oh, I do just want to get in the water right now. But uh, <laughs> I, I would uh, – I would add one more name and, and I think it's, and, and we've talked about him a lot, so it's not like we got to go super deep on him, but it's true. Tranquil. You know, I think when you talk about the fronts that, that Brandon Staley wants to run and having one linebacker on the field only, you know, that's, that's going to be important, you know, and I think of all the linebackers, he's the one. So if he takes that next step, you know, if he's ready to be, you know, that guy who can diagnose a t- and he's so good at that. If you watch film on Drew, you see when he figures, you know, he figures it out and he's there. I mean, it's, it is a split second. Nobody is at that point of, you know, uh, at that point of the play where it's developing like Drew on this team. So I think that's a real important one because we know it's been hell, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping this off season has been good to him and that he can stay healthy. Cause I think that ends up going a long way if he's the one guy that's going to be out there. He's been killing the podcast game. He had Coach Staley at his house, yeah, right? You know, so <laughs> that was his last guest. Exactly. Uh, the coaching staff and Drew have a have a good relationship at this point. No, certainly, certainly. I'm waiting for my invite. Uh, I'm sure I could add some really compelling conversation to what he's doing with Coach and Justin. And yeah, he's got the A list going. You got stuck with me, Chris. No, I, I want to. I'm keeping you here, bro. You're not going on another podcast. <laughs> you got the best backdrop of uh, 2022 right behind All right, you. There we go. Amazing. Exactly. All right. Go uh, go get in the water, man. Uh, Chargers fans, thank money for coming on at 5.30 in the morning Hawaiian time. All good, man. Breaking down uh, the Chargers here as we hit the offseason. For money, I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly. We'll see you next Thursday.